In April 2015, the Faculty Senate asked the UW Libraries to develop a proposal for an open access publication policy. The resulting recommendation was discussed for the first time in March 2017, and after a series of conversations, clarifications, and revisions, the Senate will be voting at its May 2018 meeting on whether to adopt the policy. This presentation gives an overview of the details of the policy, alongside answers to many of the questions that have come up in conversation. Before getting into the policy itself, it's important to understand the reasons that the Senate is considering taking this action. Many faculty members at UW and across the world are increasingly frustrated with the current scholarly journal publishing system, which they feel no longer promotes and progresses research in a way that it was originally meant to. The current system relies for the most part on federally funded research done by researchers often associated with public institutions like UW. These researchers produce valuable intellectual property and submit it to journals without any expectation of payment. Other researchers perform valuable peer review on the articles, again without expectation of payment. Publishers then require authors to completely sign away the copyright to the articles, and then only provide access to them through tremendously expensive subscription fees. Only the small number of people who are associated with institutions wealthy enough to afford these subscriptions can actually read the articles, but even they often cannot reuse them in the ways that would contribute to the progression of research as a whole. This can cause huge problems for authors because of the huge power imbalance that exists between authors and publishers. Most of the time, publishers require that authors completely sign away their rights, which means that authors can legally no longer use their own work in the ways that they want. The system also means that only a tiny fraction of the world can actually benefit from the knowledge that researchers produce. Doctors and patients can't access the latest medical studies. Researchers in the Global South and at smaller institutions in the United States that can't afford huge subscription fees cannot effectively take part in the scholarly conversation and community research partners cannot access the results that they have helped produce. The idea of an open access policy has been gaining momentum over the past 15 years as a tool to address the imbalance. Harvard was the first U.S. institution to adopt a policy back in 2008. Since then, dozens of U.N. institutions have adopted policies, over 50 of which are based directly on the Harvard model. It's important to note that OA policies are not designed to destroy the scholarly publishing system, but rather to restore a balance. And with a number of open access repositories that have been in existence for, at this point, decades, we have historical evidence that it's possible for traditional publishing to exist in harmony alongside open access. For example, the Physics and Math Open Repository Archive has been around since the early 90s, and in many subdisciplines has near universal coverage of research done in those areas. Similarly, PubMed Central has been the required deposit point for NIH-funded research since 2000. Math, physics, and medical journals are still flourishing, and the libraries has no plans to discontinue subscriptions in response to passing an OA policy. So let's take a look at the proposed policy itself. There are three main points to remember. The first is that the policy states that all faculty authors grant an automatic, non-exclusive license to the university so that it can make scholarly articles freely available in UW's open access institutional repository research works. The policy leaves the term scholarly articles undefined because we know that there are often disciplinary differences around what this means. For example, some disciplines use conference proceedings rather than traditional scholarly journals. But the universal theme is that these are works for which an author does not expect to receive any kind of payment. Books are not covered by the policy, book chapters aren't covered, and even shorter pieces of scholarship are not covered if an author expects to receive payment for it. The second part of the policy is that the author promises to make the material available openly, usually by depositing the post-peer review but pre-publisher formatted version of the article into research works. The third crucial point is that there is a waiver system explicitly built into the policy. We know that there will be times when an author does not want their articles made openly available, if, for example, they decide it's important to publish in a venue that's hostile to this kind of policy. It's extremely important that authors be in complete control of their own publishing decisions, and so authors may request and will be automatically granted a waiver for that article. Let's dig a little deeper into the license. Under U.S. copyright law, the actions that are required to distribute a work of intellectual property are the sole right of the copyright holder. So if an author wants someone else to distribute their material, they must explicitly grant that third party the right to do so. In a traditional publisher agreement, authors are often asked to completely transfer their copyright. And while this does mean that the publishers end up with the rights that are necessary to distribute the material, authors are often left with nothing. 
This leads to the ridiculous situation where an author doesn't have the right to legally post a PDF of their work to their website or to distribute copies of their articles to a class because both of those things are legally only allowed of the copyright holder. But it doesn't have to be that way. With the OA policy's non-exclusive license, UW is granted the rights that are necessary to distribute the material, but authors are left with the exact same rights that they started with, including the right to enter into another agreement. The license also allows UW to grant back rights to the author if those rights are lost in another agreement. Now for the deposit portion, the policy states that authors will deposit the post-peer review but pre-publisher formatted version of the article into research works. Again, under copyright law, faculty authors have the automatic copyright to their work up and until the time that they sign it away in a contract. In the traditional publishing process, an author submits an article to a, to a publisher, it goes through the peer review process, and once the content of the article is finalized, then the author signs the publishing agreement. That version, with the final content but without the final format, is clearly owned by the author, regardless of the publishing agreement, and so that's the version that gets deposited into research works. Now, the short version of the policy focuses on research works deposit as the means of fulfilling the access portion, but because this is about outcome, not method, the FAQ documentation makes it clear that there are actually three ways of fulfilling the policy. The first is by depositing in research works, but we also know that there are a number of fantastic disciplinary repositories that researchers are already using, and we want to encourage that. So if you deposit in a repository that has a nonprofit mission and a commitment to long-term preservation, this counts as fulfilling the policy. Similarly, we also want to encourage authors to use open access journals. So if you're making your article openly available that way, we of course don't want to make you do twice the work by also having to deposit into research works. The final crucial point to come back to is the waiver system. Again, we know that a few publishers simply refuse to publish material that's covered by this kind of policy. And because faculty themselves are the only ones that it's appropriate to make the decision about where it's appropriate to publish, the policy gives authors the flexibility to get out of the deposit requirement. Authors request and are automatically granted a waiver whenever they want one. There are no review boards because, again, it's crucial that the faculty be in charge of the decision-making process about where they should publish. Now we often get the question of why the policy is designed as an opt-out system rather than an opt-in system. From a philosophical perspective, it's because this is designed to address the power imbalance between authors and publishers. We don't want this to be a situation where authors are having to negotiate with publishers, and this way it's the faculty of the University of Washington stating that this is the policy that all authors abide by. But opt-out also provides much stronger legal protection than opt-in. And here it's all about the timing. Because the license is automatic, authors don't need to remember to sign anything. And we automatically know that the UW license precedes any publisher agreement. There can be no argument about whether the publication agreement takes precedence because the UW license has rock solid seniority. Finally, as a brief wrap up, some reminders about what the policy does not do. First, it doesn't restrict where authors can or should publish. The policy recognizes that authors are the only people that should be making that decision. Second, the policy does not force authors to publish in an OA journal or to pay article processing charges. And in fact, to deposit into research works is a free way of complying with funder open access mandates. Third, the policy doesn't take copyright away from authors. It in fact allows authors to keep their copyright in a situation where they're often stripped of it by publishers. And finally, it's important to note that the policy does not include any penalties for non-compliance. This is not meant to be something that the university holds over authors' heads. It's a tool to empower faculty in their negotiations with publishers and to make sure that UW research has the broadest impact and benefit to the world. Thank you for watching, and if you have any questions about the policy, please don't hesitate to contact the Library's Scholarly Communications and Publishing Department at uwlib-scp at uw.edu.